Okay, so today I have a Rotel RX 1050 on the bench. Nice looking receiver. Made by Rotel in China. Not a good sign. But nice looking stereo receiver overall. All right, here we go. Power on. So I did hear the speaker relay click. I do not have an antenna connected to it right now. So if I go ahead and power it back off and back on, well, it did remember I was on it. Let's go ahead and kill power completely and see what happens. Power on. Well, it did remember briefly. Well, let's go ahead and take the top off, see what's inside. All right, so I have the top off and as you can see, a lot of dust in this unit. There's the pre-drivers, the big heat sink for the power amplifiers, the big filter caps, Rotel on them, 12,000 microfarads, 80 volts. So I'm gonna go ahead and blow this thing out, see if we can get some of this dust out of this before we go any farther. Okay, got it all blown out, cleaned up. Look at that thing, it's beautiful inside. Up in here, the standby power supply. The big Toro power transformer, custom designed and manufactured by Rotel. Big filter caps right here. They even state low ESR. The pre-driver board. And then down in here, are the eight power transistors. So I'm thinking if this thing has a memory backup issue, it's gonna have an issue up here on the system control board. So I'll probably get the front off of this thing, take a look inside and see what's in there. Maybe there's a lithium backup battery, I don't know. But Beautiful design, looks really good. It really should have a clear plastic top on it. Okay, well, unfortunately, I do not have a schematic on this unit. So I'm gonna have to kind of wing it freehand. Right here, 5.6 volts, which is this pin. I'm gonna follow it across this jumper, across this jumper, and then it's this large trace. And it runs over here to this capacitor. And then if you notice, there's a blocking diode right here. And then it goes through a resistor and then to this capacitor right here. It's a fairly large cap. And I see the positive right here. So let's go ahead and do an ESR check on this capacitor. There's the negative, there's the positive. ESR meter is set up, 0.00. .00. So let's go ahead and check the ESR of this cap right here. I see nothing whatsoever. And what leads me to believe this is the battery backup the memory backup, it goes through this resistor, through this one jumper, into one lone pin of the microprocessor. So next, I need to go ahead and tear down this front panel assembly and gain access to that capacitor and see, is it a super cap? Is it just a regular electrolytic capacitor? I don't know, but let's go ahead and tear this thing apart and see what that capacitor is, because I believe that is the memory backup capacitor. Well, do you see what I see right there? It is a super cap. It is a 0.1 farad 5.5 volt capacitor. And look at that. It is absolutely split open. So I need to find a replacement 0.1 farad 5.5 volt capacitor for the memory backup. Well, this is the exact reason when I scrap out a unit, I save the old parts. I just happen to have a 0.1 farad 5.5 volt super cap that I robbed out of an old unit. So I'm going to go ahead and put this in the Rotel. I won't charge the customer for it, just labor time only. Anyhow, look at that. Still sealed. No cracks whatsoever. Let's go ahead and do an ESR check and see if we get any resistance. 
So we'll go ahead and short the leads out, make sure we get close to zero, and we do. Now these aren't the most low ESR caps on the planet, but I see 6.6 ohms on this one. I am perfectly fine with that because it's feeding an extremely high impedance input, just a memory backup, that's it. All right, new cap is installed. It is soldered in place. Let's go ahead and loosely reassemble the unit. I'll try to power it up with the front panel hanging out of it, measure the voltage on the cap, shut it off, and make sure it has backup voltage. So since I have the unit apart, now is the perfect time to do some spring cleaning. So I have my voltmeter set up here and I did solder a lead onto the positive of the capacitor right here. But I just want to make sure that if I go from chassis ground to the negative of the capacitor, I get zero ohms and I get 0.6 ohms. That's pretty good. So I'm going to put my voltmeter between the positive lead right here and the chassis ground somewhere on the chassis. And we'll power this unit up for like one second and see what kind of voltage this capacitor charges up to. Now keep in mind, this is a resistor. I'm not sure the value you're probably like 100 ohms or so. Yep, exactly 100 ohms. And so it's going to limit the charge of that capacitor based on the capacitance and the resistance of that resistor. So I'm going to go ahead and hook up my lead. We'll put it on the 6 volt scale, which it's on right now. I'll just put it in manual so it doesn't overrange. And I'm going to go ahead and just hit the power button. And now let's go ahead and power the unit on for about one second and see what that capacitor charges up to. On, off. So in that short amount of time, it charged up to 0.8 volts. That's probably not enough to back up the memory, but let's go ahead and give it a few seconds and see what happens. So it's still charging, 3.8, 3.9. So obviously it needs to be on for a couple of minutes to get a full charge into that capacitor. So I just want to see what the voltage is on the other side of the resistor, 4.887 volts. So that's what the theoretical maximum charge on that capacitor is. Well, we are at 4829 and still charging. Let's go ahead and kill the power and see what it drops down to. Power off. Okay, so the unit has been off for about 24 hours right now, and it's not connected to AC power in any way, so not even the standby is running. So I want to go ahead and check the voltage on that capacitor real quick and just see if it's more than about 3 volts to back up the memory. So there it is, 3.822 volts. That's more than enough to keep the memory backed up. Let me go ahead and apply some power to it. Power on, and it's charging back up. I think that's going to be fine. Okay, so one thing that I did notice, I have my MP3 player connected right here, and it is playing audio, but I only have one input connected to the left channel, and I hear no audio. If I connect it to the right channel, I get audio. And if I move the left channel to the right channel, I get audio. So I know it's feeding audio into the unit, no problem but I have no audio on the left channel at all. But watch what happens when I reach in here and I jiggle the speaker relay right here. 
Now I've got audio, but I can wiggle the relay and the audio becomes distorted. There's two relays up in here. It's kind of hard to see them. So what I need to do is go ahead and pull those relays out of the unit. These are the type that can be disassembled and I'll take them apart and go ahead and clean the contacts just with a piece of paper. That's all that's necessary to clean up those contacts, nothing else. They're probably either gold plated or silver plated contacts and there's a small amount of oxidation. This is a very common problem with stereo receivers that have mechanical speaker relay contacts. Okay, well here, are the speaker relays. There's one of them right here. You can only actually see one set of the contacts because they buried the other set of contacts up underneath this cross brace right here. The other one lives right here. Easy access to get it out, no problem. I don't know if I can get my solder sucker tip up under there to unsolder these three connections that you cannot see. But if I tip it up, there they are under the cross brace. So let me see if I can get that thing unsoldered without having to remove the cross brace. Because to remove the cross brace, there's also a screw right there and another screw all the way up under the far left side of the cross brace. That doesn't seem like much of a problem, but to get to those screws, they're underneath this circuit board right here, which means I have to remove all the jacks, the speaker terminals from the back panel to get this board out, just to get those two screws out of the way. So let me see if I can get the solder sucker tip up in there and get these things unsoldered without having to remove this complete board. Okay, well I did manage to get them out. So let's see if we can get them open somewhat easily. So I got the one side open right there. And then there are the contacts. Okay, hopefully this will focus. I have it in the autofocus mode, but you can take a look at those contacts and just take a look at how oxidized they are. They've definitely seen better days. So now to clean them, all you need to do is put a piece of paper in between the contacts and then just activate them to be closed like that. So I think what I'll do is apply 24 volts DC to the coil so they'll be closed and we'll just drag a piece of paper through it several times. I do have a burnishing tool, but I find that that takes too much of the coating off of the contacts and normally just dragging a piece of paper is just abrasive enough to get the contacts cleaned. Okay, hopefully this will stay in focus for a moment. We're just gonna stick the paper in there and close the contacts on it. And then I'm just gonna polish the contacts. Now you don't wanna use any kind of cleaners that will leave any residue, nothing oily. But I've had tremendous success cleaning relay contacts just with a simple piece of paper. Like I said, it is just abrasive enough to clean the contacts. Might be hard to see, but it did pick up some stuff off of there. You can see the dirt that's been collected. Let's take a look at the contacts now. Well, you can definitely see the shine on them right now, much better than before. That's all it takes. So let's go ahead and do the other one. We'll put it back together. Well, here's the results from the second relay. A lot more gunk came out of that one than the first one by far, but they're both cleaned up. Let's put them together, put it back in the unit now. Good as new. Soldered back in place and ready to go. All right, let's go ahead and power the unit back up right now. Main power relay, click. 
speaker relay click, have the volume quite low. Both channels are working at a very low volume, which tells me the contact cleaning was very successful. So you might ask, did I check the memory? Yes, I did. After I powered the unit back up for being off for over 24 hours, it remembered the base and treble settings because they are not analog controls. They are rotary encoders and it remembered the last FM station that was in it when I powered the unit down. So the memory problem has been taken care of. A very nice Rotel receiver, very nicely laid out, fairly simple to work on. It looks like it's a powerhouse, has that nice Toroto power transformer, much, much more efficient than the old square iron core transformers. All ready to go. I just got to slap the covers back on it and ship it back to my customer. I think he's going to be very happy to get this unit back in his audio library. If you could go ahead and hit that subscribe button and like this video, it really does help my channel grow. You can follow me on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter at NorCal715. You can email me NorCal715videos at gmail.com. Go ahead and leave me a question, a comment, a concern down below. I try to read all the comments and I respond when I have time. Remember, with your help, we can try to keep these things out of the landfill, out of the recycle bin, and out of the e-waste facility. Everybody, thank you for making it to the end of this video. I really do appreciate it. Everyone have a great day. Once again, thank you so much for watching. Bye-bye.